Hello there guys, so another video here for you today on the Benjamin Aquila and what we're going to be doing today is stripping it all down and rebuilding it with a reg in it. So let's get started. What we're going to do first is take the stock off and that's using a 5mm Allen key in this hole down here. That's the stock off and next thing to do is to degas the rifle. Now you could shoot it down till it's empty. What I've found works is just loosening the gauge a little. I'm using an adjustable. I've already done it to save us some time, but just put it on the flats there and then just crack it loose. You'll hear it start hissing, but obviously mine's already empty, so I don't need to. The last time I rebuilt this gun, I did put a little bit of Loctite 542 in the hole there. So my one's got just a bit of Loctite residue in there, but I'll clear that out and put some new stuff in when we rebuild the rifle. Next thing I'm going to do is take a measurement in between here. Because the trigger plate clamps on with a screw here, it's possible to move the trigger forwards and backwards. So by taking the measurements here, we get to keep our same trigger settings. So on my rifle it's looking about 64.6. So I'll just write that down. And just taking that measurement there ensures that when we go to rebuild the rifle, we can keep our same trigger setting. Plus taking that measurement ensures that the trigger is lined up with the cutouts in the stock. Right next, I'm just gonna slide the cheek piece off and we're gonna take this top rail off. And that's done with a four mil Allen key in these two screws here. And then the rail just slides off. Next up, we'll take the shroud off. So it's quite simple. We do is grip it and unscrew it. It's screwed on at the back here, so we're just unscrewing the outer sheath. And then once it's unscrewed, we can just pull it off. There it is there. It has got a number of baffles in the end, so if you wanted to take them out as well, you could just undo this knurled part at the end there and tip them out. But for now, I'm just gonna leave them in. There is a spring in there as well, so just be careful of that when you put it back together. Another thing to note when unscrewing the shroud is that I've found it best to sort of pry the barrel away from these two rings here. When undoing it, my shroud touches this back ring here, and whilst it didn't scratch the anodizing, it does make a little mark on the shroud. So just lightly bend the barrel out of the way as you unscrew it. If you did want to leave the shroud on the barrel, you could take the barrel out whilst leaving the shroud there. But since this is a full disassembly, I took it off. Next up, we're going to remove this piece at the end. And the easiest way to do that is just stick a Allen key or something through the hole and twist it. Next, we're going to remove the back piece here. And that's done with a 1.5mm Allen key. Don't need to remove the grub screws all the way. You can just pull it off like that. Right, next, we can take the barrel out. Now, on my one, I've already taken it out, but from the factory, there was a little Delrin disc pressed into this back hole here. All I did to remove it was stab it with a nice pointy thing, get it hooked up onto one side, then use some tweezers to pull it out. Not quite sure exactly why it's in there. It might be a pseudo seal or something like that to stop air escaping around the transfer port. But there you go. Hook it onto one side, then using some tweezers, pull it out. It is only plastic, so probably if you heated the end up of the sharp pointy thing, stabbed it, waited for it to cool, you could just pull it out normally. And it was only in the back one. But once that's out, we can use a 2.5mm Allen key and just loosen the two barrel grub screws. You don't have to take them all the way out. And pull the barrel out can be a little stiff as there is toe O-rings on the end there. Right, next we're going to take the trigger linkage off, so we need to remove this cover plate. And that's done by using a 2mm Allen key in both of these screws here. Once that's off, pull the cover plate off, and that reveals our trigger mechanism. Now I have given this a little polish up, and it has made it a lot better, but I'll show you exactly what faces are polished in a minute. For now though, we're just going to unhook this linkage here. You could take the pin out, but my one's quite tight in the block. And then 
we can just loosen this screw here and that's using a 3mm Allen key. This is just a split clamp so as we loosen this the trigger goes all floppy and we can just slide it off the tube like so. There really isn't that much to this trigger mechanism and I'm not going to bang the pins out. It's quite a nice trigger though. The safety is a total disconnect so it lifts the trigger arm up here and there's no way you can pull the trigger when the safety is on. As soon as you release it the trigger is able to fall down and fire the rifle. If you wanted to you could adjust the blade and that's done with this grub screw here. Just a 1.5mm allen key. You can move it up, down and side to side. I'm just going to leave it as is for now. Next up we're going to separate the air tube from the block. That's done with a 2.5mm allen key in these two screws here. Again you don't need to take these all the way up, you just need to loosen them and then you can pull the end out like so. Now here's quite a tricky part to disassemble. To install the regulator we need to separate the air tube from this part here. Now I've already undone mine so mine is stiff but it's removable. However, when I first got this rifle, trying to unscrew this tube from this part here was quite difficult. What I had to do was clamp this part in the vise and then use a big adjustable spanner across these flats here. And with the aid of some heat, undo it. It was extremely tight, but with the use of some rubber around this part here, I managed not to damage anything. But I'm just gonna unscrew mine now. There's a valve housing separated from the air tube. Right, next we'll fully disassemble the valve housing. So first of all, pull this cap out from the plenum plug. On my one, it is loose in the hole. And it just pulls out like so. I think it should be threaded, as there is threads on there. But we're going to be getting rid of this piece when we install the regulator anyway. So I'll stick that to one side. And then, using a 13mm spanner on this end, we'll just undo it. is quite stiff. And there we have it. This part's the valve, so it's got the valve return spring on one end. And I have given the ends of the spring a quick clean up. And that was just done on a surface plate. Sandpaper first, and then moved on through the grits, and then finished off with auto sole. So that's the valve return spring, and then the valve itself is this piece here. So we'll just push that out. There it is there. This is the end the hammer hits and this end is the part that seals on that steel ring in there. And this is the UK version so a brass restrictor has been banged into the transfer bolt. Although we will have to drill this out when we install the regulator. The last thing we could remove from this part is the burst disc that's under here. I'll just show you how to get it out. It's quite simple. Use a 4mm Allen key. Undo this part here, and there is the copper burst disc in the end there. You do get a spare one of these in the box. And this will just blow if you ever feel the rifle over pressure. But for now, since this one's good, I'm just going to reinstall the brass cap. Like so. So, the last thing we're going to remove on the air tube is this little foster fitting on the end here. So that's done. Using an 11mm socket, it has to be a deep one. And we can just undo it. It wasn't particularly tight on my rifle but if you needed some more leverage what you could do is put a 32mm spanner around the flats on the outside here then undo it. So there it is there. And there's the little one-way valve that goes in the end. I'm not going to be removing the end. Usually these are just Loctited on and are impossible to remove so I'm going to leave it alone. Right then, next we'll move our attention to the block. So the first thing we're going to do is remove the two trigger sears. So, one finger on the trigger sear, and then using some pliers, we can pull the pin out. That's the firing sear right there, and that's what directly contacts the hammer. I have polished this, and I'll give you a little close-up of which faces I have polished in a minute. 
give it a little wiggle and it should come out. This rifle does have a two stage trigger, it is adjustable. But I saw someone online saying it was a one stage trigger, it's not, it is a two stage one. However, from the factory mine wasn't adjusted, it was a one stage trigger when I first got the rifle. Right then, next up we'll take this top piece of Picatinny off, that's using a 2mm Allen key. Just these four screws. And then once the four screws are out, we can just wiggle, wiggle off the top piece of Picatinny here. It is dowel which I really quite like. There's two in it, one either side. And what that does is just align the piece of Picatinny rail so it's not cocked one way or the other. And that's something I really do wish FX would start doing in the impacts. The impacts got quite a lot of blocks that you bolt together and if they were dowel pinned it would make aligning in the whole rifle a much easier experience. But this one has it, so I'm really quite happy with this one. So we'll stick the top to one side and then we'll move the cocking arm. That just pulls out. It's much easier without the barrel in. And there's this assembly here. I'll disassemble this a bit further in a minute. Right then, now it's time to remove the hammer and the hammer spring from the back here. Now this rifle from the factory was fitted with an anti-tamper in this hole here. It was quite easy to remove and I'll show you some footage of that now. All I did was clamp it in the mill and put a left-handed drill bit in there, just spinning counterclockwise so it wound the screw out. It wasn't that tight and it came out relatively easy. Now that's how I did it. If I didn't have the mill, what I'd probably do is just do the same thing but in a cordless drill. Just put the block in the vise with some nice rubber protection around each side and just very, very carefully drill the anti-tamper out with a left-handed drill bit. It was quite loose on my rifle, so probably what I could have done as well, if I didn't have a left-handed drill bit, was just put a centre mark on one side of the anti-tamper and then tap it round, just counterclockwise undoing it. But that's how I got it out. Underneath the anti-tamper, there is a lock screw for the hammer spring. And that's undone with a 2.5mm Allen key. And then what we're going to do is push this pin out here. Now this pin isn't really really tight so what you can do just push put some pressure on this and then push it out with an allen key. It comes out nice and easy. Once the screw and the pin are out it just allows this back section to come out. And this back section here houses the hammer spring adjuster in the back and the spring carrier on the front here. So we'll stick that to one side and then we can tip out the hammer spring although the hammer won't fall out yet as we need to undo this screw here. And that's John with just a flat bladed screwdriver. My one is a little bent if I'm honest so I might end up remaking this. There it is there. That allows us to tip the hammer out. Now I have given the hammer a really quick going over with some light sandpaper. It is bulbous at either end so the hammer only contacts at either end and that just cuts down on friction inside the rifle. It's quite a good idea, I do like that. I may even, if we've got room, put some PTFE guides around either end of the hammer. That'll make the hammer a really, really smooth action in the block. So just an explanation of how the sear works. The sear latches on this side here. It's always sprung and when we pull the trigger it allows this sear to rise up and the hammer to fly forward. So what I've done is just cleaned up this inside edge a little. It needs a little more. I just literally gave it a little clean up for the first shooting test. I also cleaned up the face of the hammer as it was a little rough. As you can see, nice shiny surface, but most importantly, it's flat. And that's about it for the block. There are a couple more things we can take off, namely the power adjuster here. So this using this grub screw in the top. And that's a 1.5mm Allen key. There's the spring. And there's the pin. With those two things out we can just press the adjuster out from this side. And there it comes there. This adjuster is just a transfer port adjuster. So the more you turn it the more it blocks off the transfer port hole. So in theory you should get a really nice smooth power transition as you turn the wheel. So if you was in a barn and you didn't want full power you could just turn it to one of the indications here and you would linearly drop in power. 
And the last thing we can take out is just this little ball detent for the magazine in the end there. That's quite simply in this hole here with a flat bladed screwdriver, a nice small one. And then undo it. And there we have it. That's just the ball detent for the magazine and it comes in one piece. And the last assembly we'll take apart is this cocking arm here. That's simply done with a flat blade screwdriver in this screw hole here. Cocking arm's even got a little bearing in it. Quite impressive really for a rifle at this price point. But there it is there. Right then guys, it's time to rebuild the rifle and install the new regulator. So, as I said before, this is a lane regulator and there's a couple of modifications we needed to do before we can fit the reg. Firstly, we needed to mill a slot in this part here. I did it on my milling machine, I'll show you some footage in a minute, but if you didn't have a mill you could just use a tri-corner file through the threads. What that's for is to allow the regulator to breathe. This hole here connects to the spring chamber and the spring chamber can't be pressurised. So what this allows is any air that's trapped in the spring chamber to escape out to atmosphere. And co to correspond with this little slot here, what we've also had to do is put a very small notch in the air tube. You do have to remove the O-rings and as long as the reg's installed you don't need to have the O-rings on this part. Next thing we've done is drilled up this transfer port here. So this is a sub-12 model and from the factory they just bang a brass blanking plug in there. And the lane regulators specify that we needed to drill this out to between 2.4 and 2.8. I've already had a play around with this rifle and I know I needed to drill mine out to 2.8 to achieve the correct power. But you do get all that information on the little instruction leaflet that you get when you buy the regulator. It tells you what pressure your regulator is set to, what style of Belleville or spring you've got. So this is a spring type regulator. Tells you all the O-rings inside the rifle. You do also get a new set of O-rings and it tells you what size to drill the transfer port out to. And you do get the drill bits supplied in the kit. For more detailed information on the regulators you do have to go to Robert Lane's website. There is an instruction specific to the Benjamin Aquila. However this regulator is the same one that's in the Crow Puncher. So the information is pretty much all transferable. The other thing we needed to do is shorten the hammer spring. Now I'm probably going to replace this with a shorter, stiffer one in the future, but for now I've just cut down the OEM one. Flatten the end nicely so it butts up against the little spring guard and that's ready to go back. Now all rifles are going to be different and you're probably going to need to play around with the spring length if you decide to fit a regulator to your rifle, but in my case my spring is shortened to 54mm. That's what I've found works. And I have put the rifle over the chronograph and it does shoot very well and consistently. So 54mm is the spring length. The only other thing that I want to mention briefly is that Robert Lane does have a super detailed tuning method on his website. So if you're interested in that you can go read it. For now though I'm just going to leave most of the settings standard. So we're going to use the same valve return spring, a shortened hammer spring, but all other components in the rifle are going to stay the same. At a later stage we probably will come back and tune the valve return spring and change a few other things. But for now we're just going to leave it nice and standard. Right then, we're all centred up and I'm just going to run the end mill through the threads. It doesn't need to be really deep, I'm just going to go the depth of the threads. Right then, so ready to drill the transfer port out and I've just got it held in a V block. What we're going to do first, use a centering bit and just locate the top of the hole. Where they've ground the top of the brass plug out, it's a bit uneven so I think if I hit that with a drill it's just going to wander all over the place. Like that. There we have it. Right, last thing we've got to do is just put a little notch in the air tube. So what I did was I screwed the valve body on there, marked the very top of the tube where it aligns to the slot in the threads. Right 
Right then, so we'll start with the regulator and we'll just put some silicon grease around these two O-rings here. I did have to get some sandpaper and go inside this bore here. What I did was go round it with 1200 first and then some 2000 just to clean out any of the rough areas as this O-ring here needs to seal in it. But I've already done that so put mine together and the same goes for the tube inside. Just some 1200 then some 2000 just to get any lumps and bumps out. And we'll push the air tube over nice and carefully. You don't want to damage the O-ring. We'll do that up nice and tight. Bit of silicon grease around that O-ring. Drop it in there, push it down, reinstall the spring and then screw it back together. And then we'll tighten that up with a 13mm spanner. We need to align these two marks here. And there it is. Valve goes in and out nicely. Next we'll reinstall the gauge and before it goes on I'm just going to add some Loctite 542 to the threads. It wasn't leaking before uh, but I don't want it to start leaking now. And then we'll do that with an adjustable spanner. I prefer to use an adjustable spanner on the gauges as I've found they're not really a spanner size. Up nice and tight. Upon a closer inspection of the rifle I noticed that in here we actually have a bleed screw. So to bleed the air out of the rifle you don't need to loosen the gauge. You can leave that screwed in and just undo this one here with a 3mm allen key. Once you crack that loose air starts to hiss out. So I just thought I'd point that out as now there is no reason to remove the gauge unless it's leaking. Alright, at the base here we'll just make sure our burst disc cover is nice and tight and that's with our 4mm allen key. And then we'll reinstall the foster fitting. But first, a little silicon grease around this o-ring and then it goes in that way. So o-ring to the back and like the gauge I'm just going to put a small amount of Loctite 542 around the threads and then we'll do that up with a deep 11mm socket. Get that nice and tight and we can just put the cover back on for now. I will say that this o-ring here does sometimes need a little bit of silicon grease on it. When I first got the rifle it was bone dry and the cap was super tight getting it on and off but with a little bit of grease it comes on and off a treat. Right then, now that the air cylinder is out of the way we can turn our attention to the block. So we're just going to start in reverse order. First thing that's going to go on is this little magazine pin here and that just goes in this hole here. I drop it in from this side and then with a flat bladed screwdriver just do it up. This is an adjustment so what you need to do is get yourself a mag and just push it through until you get the right ball detent that you want. The height of the screw does change the height in which the magazine sits in the gun so you don't want it too high otherwise your pellet probe will touch the magazine. Right, I'm going to leave mine about there. The magazine snaps in nice, it's not going to fall out and it doesn't lift the magazine up too much so the pellet probe should glide in there nice and easily. You need to put this back before you install the air tube. Next we'll put in the power adjuster and that's this piece here. So first things first, a little silicon grease around these o-rings and then lining up this little pin with this little slot here we just gently push it in like so and then on the top here we can drop the pin in the small spring and then finally with a 1.5mm allen key we'll just do the cap screw up this doesn't need to be tight you need to feel the adjuster screw here just keep tightening until it's nice and smooth but not super stiff and I think that's it for me it's stiff enough so it's not going to rotate around on its own accord but not so stiff that it's difficult to adjust right then and next is the hammer now as I said before the hammer's been polished it needs a bit more if I'm honest 
the edges are still a little rough but what I might end up doing is put PTFE guides over each end so the hammer runs up and down in the block with PTFE guides but for now we're just going to put it back and it goes in this way up in the rifle and like all hammers no lubricants or greases then on the cock and dog what we're going to put in is just a bit of blue loctite on this screw here this has come loose all on me already just a small amount of blue loctite and that will stop it from coming loose in the future and doing that up nice and tight so the hammer's captive so we'll put the trigger back and whilst we're on the subject of triggers this is how I polish them so this is just a piece of flat ground steel I bought this, it's called a bench block it's just a nice thick flat plate of steel I put my sandpaper over the top of it and then use it as a nice flat surface to rub up all the surfaces that I want smooth and shiny so on this, this is the second sear you need this face nice and shiny as that is what the hammer runs up to cock the rifle and you also need this back edge here as that one runs on the first sear so it's in the rifle like that the second sear locks onto the first one like so and as the trigger is pulled this one rotates up and allows this one to let go there is a bit more to do to this trigger I haven't finished with it yet but what I've found best with new rifles and new triggers is to just do them a little piece at a time. If you go too mad all at once, you sometimes can ruin the trigger. So I like to just clean them up first, then work out which geometries can be changed and work from there. But we can put the sears back in, so we'll put this back one in first. And the back one lines up with this second hole in. Like so, then the first one goes in the front here and there it comes there I'll talk a little more about the adjustment which is this screw here when we put the final piece of the trigger back in but next we'll put in the cocking arm and the pellet probe now I've just given this a quick smearing of molly grease concentrating along the sides and the top since the bottom comes in near contact with the hammer I didn't put any on the bottom as I didn't want any grease running into the hammer way. I've also put a small amount around this, around the pin of the cocking arm as well. Just line that up, drop that in, just like so, and then we can cap that off with the Picatinny rail. Make sure our pins are in. As I said before, I really do like that pin system. Make sure everything is nice and aligned. I wish they'd do that on the FX impacts. Right, next, we'll just put the four screws in. And we're going to be doing that up with a 2mm Allen key. Nice and smooth. Next, we'll put in our cut down hammer spring. As I said before, 54mm and the rear hammer spring adjuster here. This is adjusted right on my rifle, so I'm going to leave it as one piece. But press it in the back there, and then put the pin through. Now that is cocked my rifle, so I'm just going to decock it, like so. And then finally, to lock all that in place, we're just going to put the grub screw back in. And that's done up with a two and a half mil Allen key. Next we'll bring back the barrel and I'll just give you a good overview of what I've done with it so far. Now as I said in the overview there was quite a big burr on the inside of the transfer port. As you look down the barrel you could see quite a big burr hanging down where the transfer port has been drilled through. What I did to remove that was just get in there with a nice half round file, gently take it out and then I polished that up with some valve lapping compound and finished it with some auto sole was a little rough in there so I did so I did have to go through it a few times and the valve lapping compound really did speed things up. As for the barrel it has been polished I did it the same way I did the STX liner 
So I've got a boot lace here with a number of knots in it. What we did was we fed it through the barrel and with some auto salt, or I actually started off with some valve lapping compound, especially around the lead and the choke. Just concentrated on those areas first. Got them to where I wanted them to be, then finished the whole barrel out with auto salt. When polishing barrels, it's extremely, extremely important to do a little at a time. You don't want to come through there and do it all in one go, or try and do it all in one go, otherwise you end up with loose spots within the barrel. Just a little at a time, and what I like to do is check it. So, I haven't gone to the final amount I want to polish this barrel yet. It does feel a little rough still in a few places, but I'm going to try it next week, and then give it a little more polish. I'll try and video that as well, just in case anyone wants to see it, but it's key to do just a little at a time and test it in between. But I'm quite happy with how the barrel feels now. It's nice and smooth on the inside. It does still have a little grittiness at the very front here, but the choke's much looser now, and the pellets are looking really good out the end of the barrel. So I've got two pellets here, one on the left, this one here, is the one that we started with and I don't know how well the camera is going to pick that up but you can actually see a part of the pallet that's been dragged off the side there. That's what the transfer port was doing so obviously as the pellet was thrown through the air it was spinning eccentrically and causing us some accuracy issues. Also if you look carefully at the skirt and the head of the pellet the rifling's awful deep. That was caused by the choke. The choke was excessively tight on this barrel and I've just polished it out a little to give us a light, looser choke. And this is the after. So this is after it's been polished. You see no damage to the outside of the pellet now. The rifling in the pellet looks a little lighter. And I'm quite happy with that. As I said before, I think it does need a little more still. But I'm going to try it this weekend. And if it needs a little more, I'll take it out a little more. But there it is. And we're just going to install the barrel in the rifle now. So, circle and grease around the O-rings and gently push it in. I have removed one of the grub screws and I'm just aligning it up. And we'll do these up with a 2.5mm Allen key. When doing up dimpled grub screws, what you need to do is do them up till they touch and then give the barrel a little wiggle. That just ensures the grub screws catching in the middle of the dimple rather than just on the side. Same with this one. A little wiggle and then tighten them up. We can just slide over the shroud back and we need to align this hole, this hole here, with the bottom. That's a vent hole. What I like to do with shroud backs is get a piece of paper, just put it between the shroud, shroud back and the block and then do up the grub screws. That's with a 1.5mm Allen key. And then we can remove the paper. What that does is ensure a little gap around the shroud back and that ensures that the shroud doesn't pick up any resonant vibrations from the block. Next we're going to put the other end on. It's just this piece here. And we're going to do that up nice and tight. I found out what is marring this surface up here. There's a spring inside the end of the shroud that helps keep the baffles pushed up against one side so they don't rattle around. And that spring is just a little larger than this outer diameter here. So what happens is when you screw the shroud on, the spring tends to ride up here and gouge out this aluminium piece. So what we're gonna do when we put the shroud back on is take the end cap off and then just tip baffles out. So we can screw, put the shroud over nice and easily. And then drop the spring in the end and then the little baffles. These are the baffles, seven of them in my rifle. I'm probably going to end up making new ones or maybe a 3D printed insert in here as these ones have an awful big hole in the end and I think I could make it a little quieter by making that hole smaller and then 
push the end cap in. Next we'll put the top Picatinny rail back on, nice and easy. That's just with these two cap head screws here. Four mil Allen key. And I'm using an L type Allen key as these need to be done up fairly tight as they are the mounting point for the scope. I've got to mention I'm not putting the little Delrin spacer back in my one. I'm not sure whether it's just a deterrent to stop you getting the barrel out but I might need to get the barrel out at some point down the range and I probably won't have a sharp pointy thing on me so I'm going to leave it out. However if you wanted to put it back you could. Next we'll put back the air tube. So we'll just silicon grease these o-rings and then put that in so the brass burst disc goes up to the top. Gently push it in and then I'm going to remove one of these grub screws. Line up the dimple with the grub screw hole which is already quite well aligned and do it up. Again giving it a little wiggle once it starts touching then just do the other one up. That's with a two and a half mil allen key. Next we're going to slide the trigger over so that just goes over the air tube like so. Slide it up and then this little and then this little linkage here can be hooked over this pin. So you can see it there. Now in the disassembly I told you to take this measurement here and on my rifle it was 64.6. .6. So we're just going to set it back to 64.6. .6. Needs to be fairly close as the hole in the stock needs to line up with this hole here. about there and we're just going to do the screw up gently. That's with a 3mm allen key. I'm not going to do it up fully yet as what we need to do is take a look at the gun and look down the side. You'll see there that the trigger plate is actually crooked so we need to straighten that up a bit. And just gently align it and then again we'll double check our measurement here. 64.68 so I think that's good enough. And then we'll just check alignment again. And that's pretty good on the alignment. Looks better by eye than on the camera. I can't get it exactly straight for the camera. But I'm happy with that. So we're going to do this screw up nice and tight. That's with a 3mm Allen key. Right then, trigger adjustment. I read online someone said that um, these triggers wasn't adjustable. They are, they are just a little tricky to adjust. Your first stage is adjusted by this nut here. If you want less first stage you just need to do the nut in. If you want more first stage then you need to do the nut out. Although in saying that you do have a range of operation. You can't get rid of the first stage completely otherwise the rifle won't cock or may not even fire. The second stage adjustment is this scrub screw down here and you get to that via this hole here. However, now we have got a proper two-stage trigger. So it's hitting a stop there, and then when we pull through, the rifle fires. So second stage, a little more, and it breaks. Nice and cleanly, and if I'm honest, a really, really nice little trigger. It really does work well. So if your trigger doesn't come with a second stage, Try doing that screw in until it touches the body. And then as you pull the trigger, the rear linkage pivots on the first sear and then allows it to break with the second. Like that. And again, it really is quite a nice trigger once it's adjusted properly. And then to finish off, we're just going to add some dry lube to the trigger. A good dusting around the pins and along the contact surfaces. Then we'll put the cover back on with the two countersunk screws. And we'll do them up with a 2mm allen key. Right then, that's mission accomplished. We've fitted a regulator to the Aquila. Now I've already had a play with mine obviously. We had to shorten the hammer spring. 
it wasn't overpowered just putting a reg in it but what it was was really overpowering the valve so we were wasting a lot of air and the rifle did sound quite noisy so you will if you do decide to fit a reg either have to cut the spring down or put a shorter one in but overall it's quite a nice job to do and whereas before we was getting sort of 50 shots for usable magazines we're now way over that i'm getting around 200 shots out of this rifle now with the regular set at 85 bar this is obviously a sub 12 model but over 200 shots out of a smaller cylinder is really quite impressive and i'm really looking forward to taking it down the range on saturday and giving it a proper try right then last job is to refit the stock before we fit that though i just want to say if you do want to fit a regulator and don't want to strip the rest of the rifle you can just undo this trigger plate here remove this linkage here from the pin and then undo these two screws here and the whole air tube just pulls out as one unit you can leave the trigger plate on if you want you can then unscrew the valve body from the tube fit your regulator and put it all back together you'd obviously have to bleed the air out but apart from that it'd be a super easy job right then and finally we'll refit the stock put the gun upside down slide the stock over and then drop in our stock bolt we're going to do that up with a 5mm allen key and there it is a fully regulated Benjamin Aquila as I said before the regulator transforms this rifle we've gone from getting around 50 shots at a usable power setting to around just over 200 and that's from a 200 bar fill so I'm really pleased with this if it's as accurate as I hope it's going to be this is going to turn into a really nice little rifle but we'll be testing it at the weekend so thanks for watching guys and I'll see you in the next one